You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Find more great shows like this at wearelibertarians.com. All right, let's get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. And it brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. It is great to see all of you tonight. First live show in a couple weeks. I'll explain why in a moment. Ryan holds here. Harry could not make it tonight. Everything's fine. I did not fire Harry. I promise. Harry did not rage quit either. Surprisingly. So with that in mind, we're talking a lot about the culture wars on this episode and just everything that's gone on over the last couple weeks, because it's just like uh, I went on vacation and just a lot. There's a lot going on. So uh, we're going to talk about I think we'll start with Joe Jorgensen talking about Black Lives Matter, because you'll probably hear a point of view from this libertarian podcast. You're not going to hear anywhere else. So stay tuned. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults, so the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Hello, everybody. It's nice to be back. Uh, I'm not sure if I remember how to do this. I'm going to... So we're streaming now. We use this thing called StreamYard, which is really cool because as the show goes on, we can see all kinds of different comments from uh, Twitch and YouTube and Periscope and Facebook. Uh... But sometimes it gets a little too close. Reinhold and I are not spring chickens. I mean, look at, just look at him. <laughs> Reinhold, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. Glad all right. Thanks for, uh, thanks for really selling that. You don't sound like you're doing all right. So <laughs> no, no, I'm having, having a great day. It is actually my anniversary today. So oh, I am sneaking away from the wife with her permission to come talk to you. Well, give her my best and thank her because I know that uh, it is uh, a, you know, it's a privilege to be mother, measure, uh, married to Heather, but it's mostly uh, a privilege to do this show. So thankfully, you have balanced the two privileges well. I'm very privileged, as <laughs> we'll get into, I'm sure. Uh, Harry said that he has been fine lined. I think that's is that a, a, a Mike Tyson <laughs> joke or? Yeah, do I need to change my name from Reinhold to Thinehold now? <laughs> should, I, should, I, should I do that? It might get better um, traction. This one, this one may not be working for me. I am a bad COVID warrior. Uh, I went to Florida last week. Uh, actually, not last week. The week before, I guess. I don't know. When when, when did I go to Florida and uh, I brought all of you Hoosiers back a, a special present? I think it was almost two weeks ago. Yeah, Because was, you missed out on the fun times in Orlando this weekend. That's right. Yeah. I uh, missed the Orlando convention. Uh, I would, my family had our first uh, family vacation in 20 years. We we grew up going to St. Augustine, Florida as a family, and my mom's 60th birthday took place. So we went to America's oldest city. If you've never been to St. Augustine, then you absolutely should go. It's an excellent destination. It's You could spend a year there and never go to the same restaurant, never go to the same attraction, never go to the same historical thing. It's uh, really good. So had had a fantastic time. But I will say that I spent the previous three months going, I can stay trapped in this apartment because in just a few short weeks, I will be spending the week in St. Augustine, Florida. And then I came back and now I am incredibly depressed because there is no St. Augustine and they're going to trap me in this house for the next year. You know, they're locking us in. You know, the, the re-lockdowns are already happening in California. It starts there and then it dominoes in on the rest of the country, just like it did the first time. Help. It's uh, it, it's going to be fun. Uh, but the thing is, we've all got practice at it now, right? So we we figured out the things that we need to do to make ourselves sane and and. uh and live in a way that's somewhat functional as human beings. Well, I will say that I have never read more than mm -hmm. in the past 
four months. Like I've finished two books this weekend. I finished five on vacation. Uh, I think if you've followed my Facebook feed and my writing and this podcast, you notice a difference just in the the amount of reading that I do and the the quality of what I say, what comes out of my mouth, I think is better because I, uh, I am constantly reading. And that's something that I learned uh, doing the Leaders and Legends podcast, which is a podcast I produce that I recommend everybody check out. And it, it is a, a history podcast and also a, a kind of a near history of Indianapolis as well. Just talking about what does it take to be a leader or a legend and using Indianapolis as a laboratory. And the thing that I learned from all those folks is how much they read. They read constantly. And the most successful people in the city I live in are, are insane readers. And so uh, I really recommitted myself to reading over the last couple of years. And it's, I think it, I think it, it, it has made a big difference on this show and it's I've reignited my love for reading and that's probably the best thing that I've learned through the lockdowns. Yeah, and I think a lot of people learned a little bit too about how much they were focusing on their jobs and how little they were focusing on home life, right? So they would spend an hour going to work, an hour to get home, all that time out doing things. I think, I think uh, when you start spending more time at home, you start realizing that that stuff's secondary. You don't really need that anymore. You know, yeah. that's don't let that run your life. You run your own life. Uh, Craig asks, what are you reading? And I have a Goodreads. If you follow my Goodreads, you may regret it because I am uh, not only do I read a lot, I am constantly looking through books for this show and for other reasons. So my, my Goodreads is just full of books and, and updates. Um, but you can follow what I'm reading there. Like what I'm reading right now is actually called Grand Dragon. That's the thing that I am I'm working my way through uh, the most. That is about DC Stevenson, who is the head of the clan in the 20s here. Really well written by an Indiana journalist in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, it's really interesting to see kind of the 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 top of the clan in the 20s and what grifters they were. And when they finally got power in 25, all of their all of their schemes like nutritional education in Indiana was implemented in Indiana because the because DC Stevenson wrote a textbook about health and wanted it to be sold all through and basically he wanted to sell to the state his uh, textbook and it went through and that's why Indiana has as nutritional education because of grift basically so so there's little things like that that you you look at the origins I'm all, I just finished on writing by Stephen King Really good, really interesting. Uh, yes, Ryan Lindsay says Chris copies me a lot on Goodreads. That's why he's such a lefty. Uh, yeah, I I admit it. I have uh, started to to sample some of Ryan's uh, communist wares over on Goodreads. So I I just think that reading is has become a new a, a rekindled passion of mine uh, over the last four months, but the last couple years, and I just. I can't encourage our audience enough to read uh, and check out the lists that we have on Goodreads. We have a couple lists uh, that I'll put in the show notes that you can check out and see if you if you want to read some books. I've got some recommendations there. Um, also, while I was on vacation, uh, mainly due to the lockdowns, it seems like the world lost its mind again. Uh, I don't. Okay, so it's hard to summarize where we've been. And I was fiddling with my uh, mic. Hold on. So the sunburn has not healed yet. You can see on my bulbous uh, nose here that, uh, yes, I am sunburned <laughs> um, still. I guess we, we, sh we should start with Confederate statues. But, but it really, maybe I'll kind of start with where, where I view the space we're in as a country and what's happening. And I don't think that it's necessarily groundbreaking, but for, for many people, it's probably not something that they've thought about too much. Uh, because I just spent a lot of the vacation, not only reading about culture wars, reading about, you know, reading about the culture wars with the clan. And you see in the, the clan fights, for instance, there was a, uh, a uh, newspaper put out by the Indiana clan was mainly anti-Catholic 
And the Catholics, to counter the fiery cross, the Klan paper, put out something called Tolerance, which was a newspaper that attacked the Klan. And in the Tolerance newspaper, they, they started publishing the names of Klansmen. They were, they were doing call-out culture, even way back in the 20s. And what happened is that it increased the roles of the Klans. And whenever a, uh, whenever a politician uh, was exposed in Tolerance for being part of the Klan, it guaranteed his re-election. And so... We often have this argument, Reinhold and I specifically, in that, well, how do you fight a fascist? How do you fight a communist? How do you fight somebody you disagree with? Well, Reinhold tends to be more on the side of you expose them, you point it out, you say this is what they're doing. And I tend to be more on the on the quarantine side as opposed to Reinhold on the inoculation side. We need to aggressively fight it. We need to give this chemo and i'm like no we need to give this a quarantine we need to put this over here and starve it of attention which is what it wants um and i think that is a lot of what is happening on all sides right now but you know it's it started with the it, it's we've lost sight of what the whole point of of george floyd's death was which was to to have a an honest decent conversation about race and an honest, decent conversation about police reform, and it's gone into pancakes and uh, call-out culture and Confederate statues, and we've gotten we we've let the media on both sides take us to a place that is frankly not productive. We're we're now feeding on each other and uh, playing, frankly, right into the hands of politicians that want to be reelected or elected in November. And what I want to do with this conversation and some of my thoughts about what's happening is convince you that unity is a high value and that unity is an important value that we have lost sight of and that it is something that we need to talk uh, a lot more about. And uh, because disunity, disintegration has brought us to the point that we're at, which makes all of us feel like we're living inside of a madhouse. We are living inside of a dog kennel and the dogs are fighting each other and we are sitting over in the corner going, how the hell do we get out of this mess? <laughs> I mean, it's, I feel like I'm being driven crazy on a daily basis. I'm not, I, I'm not a big C conservative and I'm not a big L liberal. I am not a, a member of the left and I am not a member of the right. I consider myself somewhat of a moderate. I see, uh, you know, Culturally, I am definitely in the middle. Politically, um, I'm a libertarian, which means I don't necessarily fit in that. You know, the the right and the left want to grow the size of government, and I don't, uh, because I believe that growing the size of government is a major factor in why we're all fighting with each other, which we'll we'll explain. But to kind of set the stage of where we're at overall. When World War II ended, we're going to go to World War II because that's the last big epical event that changed the dynamics of society. And then the next one really was the invention of the Internet. And at the end of World War II, the United States was essentially alone in the world. We, Because Europe had to rebuild itself, because Japan had to rebuild itself, because the Soviet Union had to rebuild itself, America really had a unique position in history. It had free markets, it had a free culture, but it also had control of the monetary system and a lot of production, a lot of hard goods were made here, a lot of innovation. And through the post-war period, America has really experienced something that is not seen anywhere else in the whole span of human history, which is unbelievable wealth, uh, a fair amount of peace, uh, and you had a fairly, you had a singular culture. And let's just be honest about the culture of the post-war era as radio and television and movies grew. It was a predominantly white culture. And so when you look at something like Gone with the Wind, that, it, that got canceled over the last week. You have, you have the, the Mammy character in that particular movie. Now, 
this flared up with the Aunt Jemima stuff. What is the archetype of this character? What is the origin of that particular archetype? It is, it, it is the notion that was fed to the North during the antebellum era that slavery was good for blacks and that they were all happy. They, they, were, they are inferior and they need us to be in control of them. And that is why they're all happy under this system because we're taking care of them. And that is the predominant view of most Americans, North and South, before the Civil War. What changes that predominant culture, uh, and, and in the media, black representation was largely that happy character, right? The, the, the so-called happy Negro character. Because it was a form of propaganda that was pushed from the very beginning of this country. That's why so many people of color are offended by the Aunt Jemima, Uncle Ben characters, even though they may have been portrayed by people and their family now say, oh, we, we are mad that you're changing this. The, the archetype was there for a specific reason. It was there to put people in their place to remind them from where they came. And what changed was northern soldiers moving down into the south. And as northern soldiers moved into the south of this country, they began to see the truth, and they began to write letters home. And so the people at home didn't understand exactly what their family and friends were talking about. They thought they had lost their mind. They thought these people have been brainwashed by whatever's happening down there because the, they're all happy under slavery. And... That wasn't the truth. The truth was that they saw the most tyrannical and oppressive system that has ever existed on American soil, and that's what slavery was. It killed, by conservative estimates, at least 5 million black Americans, black human beings, men, women, and children. It destroyed families. It destroyed previous cultures. It destroyed languages. It, it destroyed names. It destroyed identities, and replaced with that was a an identity that was obedient to whites. And as Americans from the North moved into South, um, Southern America, they started to see the truth. And they started to... And so by the end, by, because Americans were not abolitionists. Um, Northern Americans were not abolitionists by and large during the civil pre-Civil War era. Like Abraham Lincoln like Stephen Douglas, many of them bought into the notion of white supremacy that I outlined beforehand. There was a, an abolitionist newspaper, a newspaperman in Illinois that was killed. Uh, the, the most famous abolitionist of the era until Frank, Frederick Douglas came along, William Lloyd Garrison, was largely seen as an extreme troublemaker. John Brown was arguably someone that delayed the freeing of slaves because he was the person that the South pointed to and said, see, do you want them running your life? Do you want them having control over you? This person that commits illegal acts against American soldiers. And so we, through the frame of history, look back at a John Brown and we recognize him as a legitimate hero. But at the time he was not seen that way. And so post civil war, you started to see the abolitionist mindset begin to perpetrate throughout the North and it, somewhat in the South. Abolition really started in the South and then moved North uh, and found a, a home in people like the Freeman newspaper and William Lloyd Garrison. And you had this changing of the culture. Now, some of that was fought by what's called the lost cause mythology. And the lost cause mythology is just that. It is... It was fought over states' rights. Well, Reinhold, a state's right to what? To own people. <laughs> That's right. And so, yes, there were tariff battles. Yes, there were battles over states' rights. Yes, there were military skirmishes even before in the lead up to the Civil War. But the Civil War was largely fought because you had a shifting of American culture from uh, an economic system that was based on owning people to one that was 
not. <laughs> and the people who had the, uh, the most invested in that wanted to keep that economic system in place, especially since the value of slavery, the value of owning people had largely increased after the cotton gin was created. And it was your, your wealth. The South was the, the slave trade in the South before the Civil War, right before it in the 1850s, had more in wealth than all of the manufacturing of the North combined. So they were very wealthy, no matter what you've heard about them being, you know, yes, they were disadvantaged because they couldn't make their own this or that, right? But that was an epical shift. And so you still have ghosts of that living through the country up until some of it exists today, but especially in the 60s, where literally no person of color was registered to vote until the Civil Rights Voting Act in several southern states. Like your grandparents, a listener's grandparents were, were not able to vote. Like that's how near some of this stuff is. And in the post-war period, which was not that far off from the period that we're talking about, the post-Civil War era, yes, attitudes began to shift. And the world wars helped increase that shift because they served together, especially in World War II. World War I was segregated because of Woodrow Wilson, but World War II... I believe it was Eisenhower. Did he desegregate the armies in World War II? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I think, I think that's right. And yeah. so everyone, uh, but you had many black regiments in World War II say, why am I here fighting for a country that does not give me my full rights? Because many Southern Americans did not have full access to their rights. If you could not register to vote, you could not serve on a jury. So if no black person can serve on a jury and a black person is committed of a, is being uh, prosecuted of a crime, they don't have their peers on the jury, do they? And so the post-war culture was still predominantly white, but it was very, it was very wealthy. And then after the civil rights era, you started to see more black representation begin to increase in society. O.J. Simpson, believe it or not, was a very important cultural touchstone because in the early 70s, he was probably, arguably, the most famous athlete. And he was uh, put in many TV commercials. He was the first black spokesperson for the car company Hertz. Uh, so you started to see little seeds pop up through the 70s and 80s, but it's still our grandparents' culture was predominantly white. Now, what happened when we hit the end, uh, it was also largely that same. Think about how our grandparents, where our grandparents worked. My grandfather worked at one place for 30, 40 years. He worked at Eli Lilly. He went in as a chemist. He hit the clock. He came home. He had dinner on the table, thanks to my grandmother that you had a one income household and then things started to shift under our parents where you needed a two income household. Well, now everybody needs a side hustle and everybody's got an MLM because we need a third income between two people to exist. And that is the result of the federal reserve. And as the, as global trade picked up because air travel, railroads, boating, energy prices became cheaper and you could move around the world faster, globalization began to take shape. And so money always goes where it's cheapest. And so they start manufacturing things in places like Mexico or China. And that robs rural America of a lot of its base of income. And a lot of rural America, the dirty little secret, is supported by the federal government and bank loans and uh, agriculture benefits and farm subsidies. So the very people who vote for Trump who uh, want freedom are usually largely supported by the federal government uh, in many different ways. And so what you have is over time, over uh, from 72 on, when we go off the gold standard, you start to see the rate of inflation, the cost of living start to rise. You see wages stagnate. And so the cost of a house goes from 50,000 to 150,000. The cost of a car goes from 5 to 25,000. And and that has continued to increase, but your average wage doesn't. There's a big sign on the McDonald's near me that says, "Great job at McDonald's, start at $10 an hour." My first job in 1997 was at $11 an hour. 
So that job has not kept its pace. So the the lower income brackets especially have not increased in their standard of living. Uh, part of that is because of just the parasitic nature of government and the parasitic nature of the Federal Reserve. But then you get to the internet age, and that opens up all kinds of new opportunity to many people, specifically people like me and Reinhold, people who come from middle-class families, and I had a computer in 1994, and I'm young, and I'm a digital native, and I have access to all this stuff. Well, if you're um, a steel worker from Anderson, Indiana, that lost your job 20 years ago, it's, it's much harder for you to break into the tech boom over time. You're left working at warehouses or lower income jobs. And the internet does something else. It starts to, the internet and communication and globalization start to make the world more multicultural. And this really sets the stage for the moment that we're in. We're in the middle of something called a cultural Thucydides trap. Now, Thucydides trap is coined by uh, Graham Allison, who just wrote a book about America and China called Destined for War. And it basically is as Sparta declined and, uh, and Athens rose, friction and eventually war broke out between the two. And in his summation as he talks about in this book using 18 different examples is that as one great power wanes and another starts to rise the inevitable friction between the changing order causes war and so he he is warning of the danger of an american versus a chinese war as the economic system of china increases who by the way signed a deal with iran bailing them out today uh and then now getting around the sanctions thanks to china uh, China continues its road uh, belt and road program where instead of going in and offering military support and exploitation of natural resources in a country, they're exploiting the resources, but building them stadiums for soccer and roads and uh, many other and schools. And so they're using their capital in a way that we did not a hundred years ago or 50 years ago. We just sent guns. They're building schools. Now we're in the middle of a cultural Thucydides trap. And that means that that predominantly white post-World War II culture is starting to wane. It is best typified by Donald Trump. Donald Trump did not create it. Donald Trump is a product of it. Donald Trump is a product of the baby boomer culture. I want it to, he, he defines American exceptionalism as my wife has the biggest boobs. I have the most money. My plane is the biggest. My house is the biggest. My country can kick your country's ass. And he has a very, he, he generally views things in terms of domination. How can I dominate this person? How can I, how can I destroy this person so I can get over? It? It's the concept that there's a closed, that, that, that the world is a pie and that every piece you get is a piece that's taken away from me. And that just isn't how the world really works. The world is a complex system that Donald, Donald Trump and many of his adherents can't understand the complex nature of the world that they're living in at the moment. And that, like, I need to close the borders to stop these workers from coming in. Because if these workers come in, then I'm not going to get a job. Well, no, that just means your hospital isn't going to have the doctors that it needs because you're not going to go be a doctor overnight if ever, right? You're not taking jobs away from American doctors. You're lessening the amount of doctors that are going to be taking care of people in hospitals. So it, 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 it's, it, it's a backwards thinking. So immigration is best illustrated by the rise of women in the workforce. As women came into the workforce in the 70s and 80s, you didn't see men losing their jobs you saw brand new markets being created like nonprofit. The nonprofit sector didn't exist until empathetic women came into the workforce and build that entire sector. Now there's way more jobs. As the amount, as the supply of labor increases, so does the economic opportunity. The more people making money, the more jobs there are because they're out spending money. And, and it's just like we see now because I can't go spend my money at BW3s because of COVID, BW3 shuts down, right? So, 
th this narrow thinking of I need to hurt them before they hurt me or else I won't survive is domination politics that is the way that the world worked for the last millennium, but it is not the future. The future is multicultural. It is creating space for different people to exist amongst each other, right? So we're, I once heard Lou Rockwell, who runs the Mises Institute or started the Mises Institute, give a speech on why he was a pro-immigration control libertarian. And it was that no forced integration should exist and that it is a violation of the NAP that you might have to live next door to somebody that doesn't share your values. Which I don't know how you don't call that racist <laughs> because that's just not how it works. The way that I tend to view things is that diversity in, enhances a person's life and that the more friends of different ways of thinking, of different cultures, of different, uh, just uh, different than me, the more rich and robust my life is going to be, the more rich and robust my life will turn out to be. And that has, as I have moved from where I grew up, which is a town called Plainfield, Indiana, which was 98% white and 2% Muslim. And I grew up in a very sheltered place. I, I grew up in a very sheltered family. Um, my family was not racist, but my family was certainly very comfortable and there were no chances taken intellectually, physically, um, emotionally in my family whatsoever. And as I have become an adult and I've gotten out to the world, and I've started to take chances and started to have conversations with people that don't agree with me or people that are from different cultures, I've started to realize what a mistake the way that I grew up was because it's better for people to experience other things than just the thing that they know. And so the, the way that I view a lot of the culture war stuff is that on all sides, but tending to be on the right, is a hunkering down, I'm not going to change, I refuse to compete. I literally had a woman on Twitter say to me the other day, you will not replace my white family. This, this clenched fist, terrified, fragile worldview that the world is about to swallow them whole and destroy them completely. And I tend to think that people have developed that worldview because they have been propagandized by politicians that want to keep them completely in tow because they're too afraid to wander off from the, the politicians. Well, I almost said plantation, but that might get me canceled. And, and, and likewise, on the left, they don't want these college professors like or, or, or in the New York Times, we can't have Barry Weiss on staff because she goes and talks to Eric Weinstein. This will this threatens the, the job of the New York Times, which is to stand atop its hill from its enlightened position and talk down to everybody who doesn't agree with us. So they now understand the truth, because once they see our truth, they're going to be converted. And any liberal notion of free discussion will will begin to threaten that every you can you can respond in a second. I'm almost done. I see a lot of fear. I see a lot of, um, I think fear and fragility are kind of the best ways to put it. You know, I just, I think as, as orders begin to change, as we begin to move from the way our parents grew up and lived into something that is completely different, a completely different era, and not just a little bit different, the internet age is completely different from the way that I grew up. You know, I'm one of those rare millennials. I'm the last of the millennials that understood what the card catalog system was at the library. Didn't have internet until I was an early teen. Like I grew up going to books and learned how to research in books and, and didn't have Snapchat and YouTube and some of the, the quick dopamine drips that we have now. Uh, and now is way different than then. It's the world is much different, and that's a much that's a scary thing, especially if you don't understand it, or if you're in a position where economically you're not secure. Uh, and and the thing that as as I kind of move between different cultures and talk to different people, I find several points of agreement. First, 
I'm tired of being hassled by the government. I'm tired of being hassled by the other group. I just want to be left alone to focus on my personal growth, my financial growth, and the growth of a healthy family. And I find that uh, it, there's a lot of agreement in a lot of places, but there's not a lot of willingness to have conversations around some of this stuff. And part of what, a made, what made America exceptional and will make America exceptional again is a commitment to unity in that in this moment, we don't have it right, but we will progress together to get it right. And we will work together to find those points of agreement that make a society healthy, build good institutions for society. And diversity has always been at the core of the American idea because we are a nation other than those Native Americans who now own half of Oklahoma, most of this country, you know, there were a few hundred thousand Native Americans spread across the United States when colonization here started. Now we're the third largest country with 300 and some million people. We're all from somewhere else and we're all blended from a myriad of different backgrounds. But we have begun to separate ourselves into pro-Trump or anti-Trump, pro-Confederate statue or anti-Confederate statue, pro-Covington kids or anti-Covington kids. Whatever the, the, the tempest in the teapot of the moment is what we have now decided that we're going to divide each other on, as opposed to trying to find those points of agreement that are there. But you have to work through the fear, the initial fear of being called names and just not giving a shit. You know, so now that was a long monologue and Reinhold patiently shook his head at several points in agreement and in disagreement. Um, but I wanted to set the table of kind of what, how I've been viewing it. I view that a lot of the disintegration is because individuals on the left and right have given up on the idea of e pluribus unum that from many one and that we are giving up on the idea of unity and finding ways to talk to each other. Here in Indianapolis, last week we had uh, a, a man, a black man in Monroe County, who there was an attempted lynching. And I first saw it and I was like, okay, this guy's on the Human Rights Commission. Okay, right. And then like, you see the video and you go, yeah, that's exactly what this was. <laughs> and then a day or two later, a woman on the canal got into an argument. She was uh, more of a conservative persuasion. Uh, someone in her group said, said uh, something racist. A group, of, uh, a group of nobody knows, but they think Black Lives Matter activists heard it, got into an argument. She shouted All Lives Matter, and then she was killed. Somebody, they, they patched it up. And the next thing you know, somebody was up on a bridge, shot her dead. And so we're now at a point where we're tit for tatting into a very dangerous place. You can look at this and you can go, I'm on this side. And so that side shouldn't have done that. Or you can look at it and go, lynchings are wrong. Murder is wrong. Calling racial epithets at each other is wrong. Like, all of it's wrong, but you have to start with your, your moral principles first, as opposed to your cultural identity. At a certain point, you have to say lynching is wrong and murder is wrong. And there is no political shade that makes either of those right. But that's where we're at. We're now at the beginnings of violence, where we no longer are starting to see the other side as human beings. We're starting to see them as people we need to punish. And... As a student of history, I don't need to tell you how bad that can get because you've seen the documentaries, you know. So, I mean, I've spent about three weeks thinking this through, maybe a month, Reinhold. Mm -hmm. Where am I right? Where am I wrong? You're right for the most part. There, but I just think that um, a lot of people are losing sight of the fact that this isn't a new thing. This isn't... A, a watershed moment in the history of the United States as much as it is a continuation of kind of what we've been going through since we kind of started this whole thing. Um, we, 
I mean, if you could think about the the McCarthy area era where there was definite cancel culture there, you have the 60s, um, which was well, that was a really big upheaval, right? The late 60s, uh, Vietnam, civil rights movement. 68 is like a watershed year. 68 is very similar to 2020, right? Because they're both years where a lot of social upheaval erupted into very angry clashes back and forth between people of different cultures trying to um, get their vision across, to get their point across, become the more uh, accepted view. Um, and, and we're kind of going through the same thing now. I mean, we had race riots in the 70s and, and late 60s. We had, you know, there were news stories that when I grew up where people were being shot because they were white by a black person or a black because they were, you know, a white person shot them. And Charlie Manson was trying to instigate a, a race war. Right. I mean, that's that was his whole motive was to was to have that happen. He wanted that's the whole helter skelter thing was to try to force that to happen. So this upheaval and culture clashing is constant in a society, especially one like the United States, which is very multicultural. And people don't want to hear that because they, they think that American culture is X. But American culture is not X. American culture is a bunch of, bunch of, bunch of ABCs, Ys, and Xs, and Zs. Uh, different areas have different cultures. Different you know, communities have different cultures. Different um, social networking and gatherings all have different cultures. And they all meld together and work together because of the basic understanding that we respect each other. Uh, but that's not the reality of it. It hasn't always been that way. And when those cultures lines and, and changes in power start to fluctuate, people get scared. People feel like they're going to be the one that's going to be done to them, what they've done to other people, or they're going to continue to be held down and they're never going to get out of the, uh, the boot on the neck that they've grown up with. Right. So there's, there's people who are upset and angry on both sides and mostly they feel like their point isn't getting heard or the point isn't getting addressed. Like we had the, the, the Floyd protests and everybody was really behind it. You look at the numbers, there was like 70% of people were um, huge supporters of doing something about the, uh, the police culture that we have and, and the, the militarization of the police. And um then then we started painting line uh black lives matters on the, the streets and we started worrying about aunt jemima and the redskins and all that stuff is great but it doesn't fix the problem right we do this all the time we never actually try to fix the problem we try to cover it over in order to make everybody nice and friendly so they can go back to buying things <laughs> to, to get our to get our economy going again so everybody can be happy and wealthy and and blah 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 only that doesn't happen for everybody the systems that have been in place for decades and decades and decades are still there and they're still causing the problems when the interstate system came out they had to choose where the interstates were going through right uh, so they had to, to take the land and, and build the interstates a lot of times those decisions were made to go through the black communities, disrupting everything that they were working towards and building. And you ended up with a lot of uh, disruption in there in, in that community. Robert Moses, uh, <clears throat> Robert, to that point, Robert Moses, the great book uh, by Robert Caro about Robert Moses, who uh, was the plan head of the plan commission in New York, New York city. I recommend the book working by Robert Caro. It's a great book. And Robert Moses was never elected to a thing, but he was the most powerful person in New York State from basically the 20s until the 60s. And he built the Triborough Bridge and, and all these different highways in New York City. And so Robert Caro in the, in, in the early days kind of said, you know, I take this from Long Island every day. And then like it's very straight, except for these two little jogs. What are those about? And so we looked into it, and it was because the most wealthy and the most well-connected owned that particular piece of land. And so he moved it around when he wanted to. Uh, he specifically bulldozed low-income housing 
to clear the low income housing out of certain areas of the city because he wanted to put an interstate. It was, you know, we did this in Plainfield when I was a kid. We didn't want the trailer park there. So we we eminent domain that land from the owner and build a Walmart and move the trailer parks from the middle of the city. Little uh, pink houses. Yeah. Yeah. Many suburbs. Our, our uh, a function, uh, our commie friend Ryan Lindsay recommended the book White Flight by Kevin Cruz, which documents the fl white flight from as cities were no longer as necessary and the rise of the automobile came about and people didn't want to live in the city and they didn't like living next to diversity. They built suburbs. And so that's why I grew up in a town that's 98 percent white. Uh, so, you know, there's redlining where in Chicago, for instance, people were blacks specifically were kept in certain parts of the city. And due to a lack of mobility, you're only able to go to certain stores that don't have the same amount of quality of goods as a white store or other parts of town. You know, it's replete. And so what a lot of the Black Lives Matter message is about is we want equal access to credit. We want equal access to home ownership because there are still banks that deny black people loans. There, there are still creditors that are treating black Americans different than white Americans or Asian Americans. We want, we want equal access. You know, for instance, in Georgia, the election that just happened in Georgia, up north, there's one voting box for every 50 people. It's white up in northern in Georgia. In southern Georgia, it was one voting box for every 5,000 voters. It's predominantly black. So these is, is the scale the same as 1965? Absolutely not. But are there still inequalities? Yes. And policing is just a touch point of that because it's the most personal. It's why white, every white American that I know fucking hates the TSA because they're touching your junk. Now imagine if that happened every time you got pulled over, you know, you'd have the same outrage, but every time you got pulled over, I saw one police chief talk about, about this in a documentary on the LA riots. That's on Netflix. Uh, it was not LA 92. It was the other one. And, and he basically, said, yeah, yeah and, and it basically was, he said, for white Americans, when you get pulled over, it's different than when you're a black American because the, the tone is different. You know, Harry has mentioned this. He mentioned it a few episodes ago. You know, they don't ask his wife for her license, but they ask for his if he's in the passenger seat and they get pulled over, you know. So it, 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 this police chief essentially said the tone that I have heard from fellow officers when they pull over a white citizen is polite. When they pull over a black citizen, it's generally domination. Put your hands on the car. Don't do this. Stand up. Don't do that. You, you have repeated and just repeated abuses in your life to your friends, to your family. And you just go, this has to be changed at all these different levels. I need the full amount of rights as other people. Uh, and how we achieve that, we can have that conversation because it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have government intervention to fix some of these things, but you sure as hell can't solve the problem if you never admit that that problem exists. And so when, when Joe Jorgensen tweets out, we must be anti-racist, hashtag Black Lives Matter, and a very large portion of libertarians jump on her or screen grab what is supposedly Spike Cohen saying exactly what I just said and we need to fix it and saying that's, that he's for positive rights, I don't get it because you're not paying attention. You're not having conversations with your fellow Americans. You're not listening to people who don't agree with you. You're just screaming Marxist. And when I defended Joe Jorgensen, I got swarmed by about two to 400 alt-right libertarian accounts telling me that I was any manner of things, telling me that I was fat, telling me that I was this racial epithet, telling me that I was a leftist libertarian, 
when I genuinely uh, that I'm pandering to the left, this is my new favorite that you're pandering to the left because you dare to say that racism exists. It, it seems as though that a certain portion of the libertarian movement has moved so far towards the anti left, anti government spectrum that they've lost sight of the pro liberty we can solve this through persuasion camp as well. Like, how do you solve a problem you don't, you don't think exists? Like, uh, to say that what, what Joe said and clarified was that she is anti-racist in the way that you're to be anti-war or that you're to be anti-abortion. Speak out. What anti-racist means to the majority of people on this planet is not a Marxist plot. It is that when your dad says something racist, challenge him on it. Why do you think that's appropriate? I don't want to be a part of that. Please don't say that to me. When, when you work in a workplace and you see discrimination going on, say something. Stand up for your principles that all humans are created equal, that all people are deserving of the same rights that you have. That's what anti-racist means. Now, yeah, there are Marxists in the Black Lives Matter movement. There are Marxists who say anti-racist and mean something else. But the you can't flatten the Black Lives Matter movement and do to the BLM movement what the left did to the Tea Party when we were in the Tea Party. And it used to drive me crazy when the left media used to take the most crazy, the, the craziest person in the crowd that we had at a Tea Party because I was at the founding meeting of the Indiana Tea Party. I was in deep. I, was, I went to dozens of tea parties. I was very involved in all that. I was very much... And even though I went to individual tea party meetings, it didn't mean that I was a Christian uh, a theocrat. It didn't mean that I believed in the, the same things as the Dominionist people. I believe that taxed enough already didn't mean that all people should worship at the altar of Christ by the force of the gun, like some of the Tea Parties up north believed. Because the Black Lives Matter movement is the same. It is a bottom-up, grassroots organization with hundreds of different organizations. And there are some major groups that have sprung out of it, just like there was the Tea Party Express, or just like Freedom Works started glomming on to the Tea Party. And yes, there are BLM websites that have Marxist language, and some of them say, I'm, I'm a trained Marxist. But that doesn't mean that every person that uses the hashtag is a useful idiot. Just in the way that I, because I went to tea parties, it didn't mean that I agreed with Jim DeMint and Freedom Works and everything that they said. And it's, it's funny. It's intellectually it, it, dishonest. Yep. And what's funny is that a lot of the people in the libertarian side that are making this point have for years said, Quit labeling us as racist just because we don't call out Molyneux and Cantwell and all these people, right? So they're saying this; they're doing the same thing. They and I don't, I don't think people are necess they're necessarily racist, and I'm not going to call like uh, a certain. I'm, I don't want to get into naming, but I'm not going to call them technically racist. But when you're, you know, you you can't paint with the broad brush and then yell that other people are painting you with the broad brush. Right. That's what frustrated me about it is that as libertarians, we're supposed to be intellectually rigorous and logical and fair because we scream about the mainstream media being unfair all the time. But then how are we going to do the same thing to score political points against our opponents? It's okay. a, it's about e yeah it's about not having to do the hard work it's about being able to 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 silence somebody else by drowning them out with with calling them names and and doing the exact same thing they complain about uh, to their opponents because it's easy and expedient to do instead of sitting and having a conversation or trying to figure out hey you have this reputation you might want to understand why you're getting it or you know, we're supposed to be not just about, so libertarians should be about protecting the rights of everybody, because if I'm not going to defend your rights, why would I expect you to defend mine, right? We should be protecting everybody's rights, but there's a lot of people on the libertarian side that are in that camp who are, uh, I just want my rights protected and that's all I care about. 
I don't care about anybody else. As long as I'm not a racist, as long as I'm not doing anything wrong, quit calling me out and quit telling me I have to do anything. I don't have to do anything. It's well, you should be trying to protect the rights of everybody else. Otherwise you can't expect anybody to care about yours. I I think that, you know, in Dion's in in the comments, and that was what in the pot, Pat Down podcast, another podcast recommendation. My co-host on the pot on the Pat Down podcast. It's a comedy podcast. This week is is a lot about this conversation. And in the past, we talked about it because I I basically said like, how are you going to get mad? And and I basically in the episode that dropped yesterday, I basically said like, here's the perce- here's the perspective of the right leaning person so i went and 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 saw my barber and it's not a republican this is just a guy a working class guy and uh he's you know didn't get any money from the government because the government didn't get to his unemployment claim but he was put out of work by the government you know and he was told you can't go to work and earn a living by the same people who then said it's okay to go out and protest in mass numbers. And the hypocrisy made him furious, rightly, because he just lost two months of income. And so he's just like, I guess I should just call it a protest. you know. And then now they're getting on to, into all this Confederate statue. And it's like, where does it end? And it, when you talk to people like on the right, or if you look at, like I listened to the Pat Buchanan, I'm a real peach in the car when you listen to the 1992 pat buchanan speech at the rnc convention where hw was nominated it's it's the culture war speech that launched it all for the right buchanan identified the poor white working class losing their jobs because of globalization and said we're gonna we're gonna fix that we need to be their champion and we need to fight the culture war we need to say no to homosexual rights. What were some of the other ones, Reinhold? Like, we need to say no to ending prayer in schools. We need to say no. Like, you listen to it and you go, they lost on every single one of those things that Pat Buchanan promised to fix, and they never got their jobs back. And then we have the audacity to look at them and go, why are you mad? (laughs) You know, and so they believed, it's on them for believing a politician and bullshit artists like Donald Trump But, you know, when you put yourself in the other side shoes, you kind of go, okay, this isn't an irrational way of thinking when I put myself in your shoes. But because you're hurting and you're mad, you want to you want to hurt other people to make yourself feel better. That doesn't make any sense. Like and it happens on all sides. It's again, it's that politics of domination. Well, and it's something, too, I've always said about people who are racist are usually people at this point in time uh, with everything we know and in, in science and, and genomes and everything else is that to continue to be that it really comes from a place of self hate, right? So they, they can't love themselves for some reason. So they're looking at some way to make themselves feel superior to other people in order for them to have that feeling of self-worth. Uh, yeah. it, it's fake and it's fleeting, so they have to continue it going on. Uh, but I think that's where a lot of that kind of gets rooted into. And I think once people start, you know, realizing that we're all human beings and we're all trying to get through this life together the same way, and we all have the same dreams and aspirations for the most part, um, and to start listening to and caring about the the things that people go through. Now, I grew up in a similar situation as a lot of people I hear today where they say, you know, if we just quit talking about race, it would just eventually go away. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody's taught to be racist. And and I used to kind of have that same mentality where if I think if we would just quit talking about it, you know, we might lose a generation, but, but the next generation won't grow up hearing that they should be racist and therefore it would go away. But that's not how it works. And once you see it, once you see how the systems work and how, how that, kind of ingrained stuff happens it's not at the surface it's not you know what was it dave rubin says well there's, since there's no law that states that somebody should be treated differently therefore it's not institutional racism and it's like no you're not understanding the phrase he, he goes on and, and actually defines institutional racism accurately after that but then says it's socioeconomic right 
well, why are the people socioeconomically different? It's not because black people can't be as rich as white people. It's because systems have kept them from being there. To pr- pr- right? prevent them from competing with right. people who don't want to be competed with. The right. reason so, the clan, the re- the clan was not in, in Indiana. The clan, yeah, they weren't fans of black people, but they were not anti-black. They were anti-Catholic and anti-Jewish. And I mentioned this on a previous episode. But the reason was was that Polish, Hungarians, uh, people from Eastern Europe were coming to Indiana and settling in Indiana and competing with them for jobs. And so there was a very low amount of there wasn't much black population in Indiana. And so they weren't mad at at them. They were mad. They were trying to show force. They were trying to gain political power to then. And there were plenty of grifters who were willing to like D.C. Stevenson glom onto it. They were trying to hurt the economic opportunities and educational opportunities of the Catholics. They tried to ban Catholic schools in the 1925 legislature because they tried to ban nuns from teaching or religious people and religious garb of any kind in schools. They also tried to pass a law that did pass that every classroom must have an American flag because they were pro America. They were pro religion, but they were anti, they were pro separation of church and state because they didn't want Catholics to come in and serve in government. And again, that's kind of why Kennedy had to fight that whole perception because a lot of those Klansmen were alive. But then once they realized that DC Stevenson was a murderer and a grifter, uh, it, it it changed their mind completely. Um, and so it was always about preventing economic competition by people who felt economically insecure. And that's what the whole immigration debate is about now. Right. I mean, that, that was the thing about the, the culture war of the twenties with the cake, when the second version of the, the clan kind of po- became popular and became such a force and not just in Indiana, but other where, but, you know, Indiana was more focused around DC Stevens, but they, people talk about how they were Democrats and well, a lot of the clan was Democrats. There were a lot of Republicans too. It really didn't matter, but what were they standing for? They were standing for patriotism, the flag, the police, the, you know, the, the keeping of our society, of our culture, you know, all these things that you, you see today and coming out of the alt-right. I mean, that was the same kind of messaging that they were giving. It's almost word for word, the same messaging. Uh, I read the book, uh, the gilded, uh, was it the gilded gate? The guarded gate. Or uh, the guarded, gate. Yeah. The guarded gate. Yeah. The guarded gate. That's what it was. Um, very good book. Uh, it details a lot of how the history of all of that came about and how they were trying to get it ha- to happen for years before. Um, and it finally just converged together and with eugenics, uh, happened and a lot of the reasons a lot of that stuff went away was because we saw what the result of that was when a person in Germany decided to take on that that eugenics mentality and fully implement the logic behind it. Right no, no right hold. No no seriously finish your thought because I was gonna John Stossel you but finish your thoughts. So I mean there were there were people um there were a lot of Nazis during the trials after the war who were saying, why are you guys upset? We were just doing the same things you were doing. We were implementing the same processes that you wanted to implement the eugenics systems. And and that's when the eugenics really died away. When people realized it was all a scam, it was a con, it was based on faulty science. And the ultimate result of that is a society that nobody really wanted to be in. All right. So, so that's how that kind of all disappeared after World War II. But then we had the 50s that like you talked about that was idyllic. And everybody talks about how we want to go back to that 50s society, how, that, how we want to have that uh, uh, mom and pop and apple pie and, and all of that happening. But that was only for a certain section of people who, who were living like that. There was a lot of people who weren't. Yeah, and- Wes, Wes makes a good point, too. He goes, it's not about ideology. It's about power. Does anyone mm-hmm. honestly think from the KKK to the right to the left that it's about ideological stances? And he's exactly right. It, the, the, the issue, the danger that we, we risk is that the right is abandoning. If you're on the right, I highly recommend, even if on your left, this is a great book. It's called 
Suicide of the West by Jonah Goldberg, and it outlines cons- conservative thinking in, in a way that is not like, I mean, it's, it's a great, great book. I, it's, it, and he talks about basically the miracle. The miracle is that, yes, there was slavery in this country, but a system was founded that eventually led to the abolition of it it led to the the liberation of the LGBT movement. It led to expanding educational opportunities for every single American. It led to all of these good things. It led to an, the United States of America, which helped ha- which halved gl- global poverty in 30 years in the late 90s. And so the system that was built needs to be preserved because the Confederate statues are a great example. It doesn't matter that taking a statue that was intended, I I am for tearing down. Let's the generic Confederate statue. Okay. Uh, Every individual case I'm sure is, has its own unique persuasions and somebody will always say, but there's this one, uh, the the reason you don't tear it down with a mob, the reason you do it through representative de- democracy, is that it is a is a peaceful diffusion of the tension around that tense thing, and so you have a hearing, the community debates it, all sides feel heard, and then the majority ha- makes the right decision. Now that's what's supposed to happen, right? And that like moving a do- the doughboy statue. Yes, right. <laughs> and, and so, when a mob comes and tears down a statue, there is no opportunity for the alternate side to have their say. Somebody just made the decision to destroy property for the whole of the community when the community really deserved an opportunity to have some input. And the reality is that as it becomes a contentious issue, more and more people move to the correct side, which is a statue that is a symbol of white supremacy should not stand, especially in parks that are predominantly catering to black Americans. That's the point of the Confederate statue here in Indianapolis. It was put up by the Klan in that specific spot in the 20s as a message. And so I don't want that up. I'm, on, I'm going to vote on the right side of that issue. But if a mob comes and tears it down, then that all of a sudden recoils the people who might be persuaded back into their identity, which I think is partly what a lot of these radical types want. They want to tear if the Douglas, the Frederick Douglas statue was torn down by Antifa, for instance, they want to inflame the Donald Trumps of the world because they love Donald Trump. All of you people who think that Donald Trump is the one standing between you and the leftist mob, you're insane because the left has never had it better than right now. Bernie Sanders is now the heart and soul of the party. AOC is now mainstreamed and she didn't exist four years ago. Joe Biden is about to walk into a landslide. Your Supreme Court justices that are your last bastion of conservatism are betraying you. What are you winning? The left has never had an easier cakewalk than with Donald Trump. And they know that if Donald Trump gets reelected, they're going to have four more years to grow the power of the radical left. And if Joe Biden wins, they know they're going to have to fight for their existence because once the liberal power establishment goes back into power, they're going to start doing what they always do, what the Republicans did to the Tea Party, which is screwing the grassroots. And so they know they have a much harder fight if Joe Biden wins to maintain their existence because the Nancy Pelosi's of the world with super majorities in both chambers has way more power than she does right now. And so it's in the interest of the far left to go tear down statues that piss off Republicans that drive up Republican vote totals because they secretly want Donald Trump to win. And so if you think that Donald Trump is saving you from the leftist horde, he's bamboozling you and they're manipulating you too. And so the, the, Donald Trump is not standing between a leftist mob. The reality is red scares are very common. We talked about this. Red scare in 1917. The House on Un-American Activities Committee and Dalton Trumbo. Watch the movie Trumbo. The, the lead up to the Iraq war. It's always the spooky leftist that's going to come and get you. But the reality is that 
the the leftists that you're afraid of when they're seen by Mr. and Mrs. Modern American in the middle of the country and the, the 1,400 feminists are naked screaming in the streets having a primal cry to fight racism. When they see that, they're just going to go, this is not a viable alternative. Can you please give me the liberal Democrat with a military service uh, instead of Mitch McConnell? I want the moderate Democrat, please. Uh, so the the reality is the there really has never been a large leftist takeover of the country there have been a lot of right fascist takeovers of the country and the way that they often maintain their power is through the red scare by cherry picking the most insane examples of the Frederick Douglass statue being ex so when i look at a lot of this i look at people who are terrified of cancel culture which i believe exists that I believe is illiberal. When I look at people who are terrified of Antifa invading their local Applebee's, I understand why people think that because I have thought a lot of that too. But as I have really kind of tried to step back and examine history and examine what, what, what's happening, I'm more inclined to believe that most of this is just bullshit from politicians trying to keep us all at each other's throats so that they can control us and get our votes. I I lived through it, Reinhold. I lived through it in 2003 in the lead up to the Iraq war. And I look back at that and I go, this, you know, I, I see the same people that were writing about Bush's propaganda and writing books about the evils of the Iraq war now standing up for Donald Trump. You know, there's some libertarian writers where I, I, I purchased the complete collection of Ron Paul's uh, reading list in the back of uh, the Republic. And I look through these names and I look through some of this stuff and I'm like, this dude's the biggest MAGA guy on the planet now. <laughs> so because he's fighting for the culture, Western. Well, that's the funny. Yeah, that's the funny thing is you talked about 92 and Buchanan. You remember in the libertarian side of things, that was when Marie Rothbard, Lou Rockwell, Ron Paul, when they were trying to get Ron Paul to run in 92 and he said, no, Pat Buchanan is going to run. We should get behind him. And they all got behind Pat Buchanan because they had come up with this new idea called new fusionism. They, they poo pooed fusionism that happened years ago before. So they decided on this thing called new fusionism where they would try to work with the, the disenfranchised Republicans, the ones who weren't the neocons, the old right, as it were. Right. Those people are the ones who, focused on culture and focused on those values that Pat Buchanan was focused on. And that's where a lot of that side of the uh, area of libertarianism came from sprung out of that was bringing those people in. That's when the racist newsletters came out. That's when uh, the push to uh, change, to have a little bit less uh, immigration, you know, have immigration policies in place in the 88 ron paul was running as a libertarian and saying that there should be no you know there should be no borders people should be able to come free and do whatever they need to do by 92 96 he had changed his tune he was now stating that in order for we couldn't have a welfare state and open borders so we'd had to pick one so we need to get with the welfare state first right so that's kind of where all of that came out of too on that side of, of things um because it's all about culture at that point, right? It's about the fear of culture, the, the fear of change, the fear of losing your, what you think is the predominant losing culture or power. Oh yeah. That too. You know, your position of power, but also thinking that somebody's going to come in and tell you how to live your life when you've always advocated for being able to tell other people how to live their life. That's really how I see it is that people are trying to preserve the ability to tell other people how to live their lives and so when I see like this, this conversation about race, I go, all that is being asked is not for you to do what the Daily Wire or Daily Caller loves to show, which is find your black friend, kneel before them, flagellate yourself and apologize for your whiteness. That's not that isn't what is being asked. What is being asked is vote differently. Stop upholding systems. There, there's systemic racism and individual racism. Most people I don't feel, and I, maybe I'm naive, but I don't feel like most people are individually racist. They don't look at somebody and they don't say the N-word. They don't, like, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm starting to go, I think I'm 
probably a lot more naive about that than, than I'd like to admit. But then there's systemic racism where you're, you're voting in economic systems and political systems that keep other people poor. Stop doing that. And I don't know why that is somehow a controversial statement in libertarian circles. Stop using the force of government to enforce your culture. And so I uh, let me, John, stop you. I don't feel that, Reinhold, you are saying that all Republicans are racist because that's always the counter claim here, right? When you have a conversation like the one that we've had for the last hour is you're never going to win over libertarians if you call all Republicans and conservatives racist. Is that what you're do doing? Of course not. I'm not calling all, all Republicans racist. I'm not calling all libertarians racist. I specifically call out that a lot of these people aren't racist, but they're caught up in things that they shouldn't be thinking or focusing on, you know, the anti-left, the anti-culture. We, we got to preserve this stuff, the conservatism of that, that they're willing to turn a blind eye to those people who are fascists, who are racist, who are trying to manipulate the system to their end. Right. So a lot of the people who are that, that I hear about this stuff, they're saying that they just, they think that the, the, the minorities are trying to get special rights, like rights above and beyond white people. And it's like, no, that's not what they're asking for. They're asking to be treated as a human being as equal as everybody else to be judged by their own actions and their own, you know, capabilities and their own mindsets and their They're own asking for personality. Liberty. They want Liberty. Yeah. <laughs> That's all they want is Liberty. And why aren't we fighting? Why, why are there so many libertarians who are fighting against giving people Liberty? Why do you I think don't that? understand it? <laughs> do, what, what do you think it is? I, I mean, I don't think that it's racism in, in like, many it's, cases. It's, no, it's it's fear. It it's the fear of it's the red scare. It's the fear of so they're so afraid that we're somehow going to turn communists, right? Everybody talks about socialism and and what that means. I mean, our society has nowhere near anything that could be considered Marxist, right? It's never going to be. That's just not how it's going to work. Um, Americans we, we are may, not governable. If, if you haven't right. noticed in the last six months, we are an ungovernable yeah. people. And the harder you try to govern us, the more unruly we become. The rest of the world is looking at us going, why are you guys so insane crazy? And it, and that was the thing when we decided to break away from England was the statement of we have created our own culture. We've created our own society, our own people. The people are different. They're They're not as refined. You know, as the Europeans are, but they're they're more independent minded, right? So we are very independent minded. We want to be able to live our lives without somebody coming in, putting a boot on our neck and telling us what to do. And that's all the minorities are wanting the same thing. They don't want to have that boot on their neck. They, you know, black people aren't celebrating Fourth of July for the most part because they weren't independent until you know, or had their technical freedom until the 13th Amendment. They're fucking disgusted by their fellow Americans and the president that intentionally inflames racial tensions. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump is using alt-right tactics. He dog whistles to the aggrieved community, inflames them and outrages them. Then everybody goes, why are they pissed off? I don't get it. Oh, just them liberals overreacting. And then, yeah. fuck you, you don't understand what it's like for us. Oh, fuck you. And then it's a tit for tat. It's, an, it's, it's a way for the alt, and Donald Trump is the president of the alt-right troll. That's why we all laugh at him. We laugh at him when he says certain shit. But that inflammation of other people is why he's hated. It's not because they have Trump derangement syndrome. People, people are just fucking shocked that their fellow Americans are so dumb that they don't see what a crass and crave. They cannot believe that Christians have fallen for somebody like Donald Trump. You've spent how many you spent since the eighties professing that this is a Christian nation and we need to be moral and we're more moral than that godless Bill Clinton. And then you flagellate yourself and humiliate yourself in public for Donald Trump and your fellow citizens don't understand what you're doing because they think you've lost your mind. They think you have Trump derangement syndrome because they can't believe that an intelligent dentist or an intelligent uh, person. 
humiliates themselves on a regular basis for somebody so antithetical to everything Republicans have said that they have believed for our entire lifetime. Yeah, everything that, that I've been told that Republicans were for, limited government, constitutionalism, you know, respect for the, the laws and everything else, he's he's torn apart the whole justice system. There's no law in place federally right now that, that makes any sense. It's it's just a big mishmash and um just the things he gets away with that the laws he's broken the the increase in government that he's foisted upon people i mean at some point you have to look and say nothing about him is conservative what was traditionally conservative the republican party has lost its bearing has lost its moorings that it thought it had and is adrift and that's why i think that they're going to have a big problem in november because until they can cast trump free they can't try to get that back and just like the left gave up on the anti-war position that they had and i'm never letting letting them try to claim that back that they're anti-war no they're not they are anti-war when republican does it they are pro-war when a democrat does it so I'm never letting that go, and I'm not going to let the Republicans get away with trying to say that, oh, no, we're for limited government and constitutionalism. No, you're not, because you allowed this person to completely destroy that whole thought process and that whole position that you had because you wanted to stick it to the left. Individualism, spontaneous order as, as a producer, uh, limited government, all of these – I think I said individual, the natural rights tradition, all of these things are antithetical to everything Donald Trump believes. And the Republicans are abandoning all of those principles for pure power politics, like I said earlier. And so now it's just tears politics everywhere. I want right tears. I want left tears. I want libertarian tears. I want left libertarian tears. Look at the society that is built in four short years. That's not the world that I want to live in. And so what's the alternative? And that's that's what I think we should address next is where do we go from here? Uh, you know, Chris says so much going on right now is people on all sides acting out of spite. You know, Wes says, why the hell do you think Republicans like me are listening and participating in a libertarian podcast? Uh, Dion says existing as a black American is to be forced to react to the stigma of my skin regardless of of how I personally feel about it. Uh, and Laura says, Joe's call to be anti-racist makes some people uncomfy because they don't know what they're supposed to do and they feel like they're being scolded. And I get that. There's also an element of them not listening to the butt. <laughs> you know, and I don't think that a lot of times there there is a good follow-through conversation. Uh, you know, you get the white liberal like Robin D'Angelo. I've not read her book yet. I'm going to. Uh, white, white fragility, you know, saying any number of crazy things when when really like in my experience of like Dion and Miss Pat at the pat down and we talk a lot about this is like when I started that I honestly and I haven't said this publicly but I honestly kind of didn't want to do it because I was mostly afraid of Miss Pat <laughs> and uh and I was mostly uh, intimidated by the conversations that I knew would come up because I didn't have language for it. And the thing that I've learned about toddlers is that toddlers are so upset because they don't have the right words to express what they're feeling and thinking and what they want. And so if you teach a toddler sign language and they can point at the cup and say, wah, wah, then they are less likely to have a temper tantrum over wanting water. It's a perfectly reasonable expectation. Like, I want water. Nobody's giving me water. Ah! Uh, and so, you know, what What I think the, the, the path forward has to be, and, and part of what we're doing with We Are Libertarians, is giving people the language to have these conversations in the limited amount of time that I have with you. And showing you that to just because they seem to be on your side and you're in an echo chamber that only gives you that language. It does not mean that that is the correct language to interpret the world around you. 
And so do not be afraid to go out and find conversations that challenge you. Uh, I, I, the greatest periods of growth in my intellectual life have come when I have no idea what to say. When I was Andy Horning's campaign boy and uh, Abdul's producer, and they would challenge me on something, I had no idea what to say. You know, when I would go on the lava flow and Roger and I would go back and forth and he would pin me with something and I had no way out, I'd go, well, I need to read more about this because now I need to know a way. When I go on the pat down, I talk to Dion who loves Bernie Sanders or Ryan Lindsay, who's a freaking communist libertarian. I don't know how, you know, when I talk to these people who are diametrically opposed in certain ways to me. I go, I need to be better. I need to challenge myself. I need to read. I need to do my homework so I can have the language to explain how I feel and think about this. And then I need to have the trust in those people that when I say this and I fuck up the way to say it, will they hold it against me? And the thing that I've learned is if you're friends, no. Harry and I can have very frank conversations about race because Harry and I have a five to six year friendship based on mutual trust. And he knows that if I ask him a question that he doesn't want to answer or it may seem offensive to him, he knows that it's not coming from a place of hurt. I'm not trying to hurt him. I'm ignorant. And I think it's the admittance that we are ignorant about other people or the ignorance that admitting that we are ignorant about a topic in a world that is so invested in vanity and narcissism is sometimes an ego hit too hard to bear. I don't know about coronavirus, so I'm just going to pretend it's not real. I, I got the, the coronavirus wrong in March, so now I have to pretend it's fake to cover my tracks. I got, I, I got racism wrong for my first 40 years, so I have to just keep doubling down and buy a Confederate flag. It's in, it's in everything, and it's pride, and it just it's a large slice of humble pie to sometimes say, I grew up in a white community. I grew up in a white culture. I didn't have to be challenged. I still don't have to be challenged. As a white, Christian, conservative, middle class, straight male, I don't have to engage in any of these conversations if I don't want to, and that's my privilege. And the reason that you don't think racism exists is because you're not confronted with it. And so the choice is to wade into the conversations and be uncomfortable and start building trust with other people about racism, about Black Lives Matter, about socialism, about all these things. And when, like, for instance, when Dion and I had a podcast talking about socialized medicine, we had very strong disagreements on the path that we both agreed on. We both agreed that every person should have the best health care available because it is what every human being deserves, regardless of race, color, creed, class, income. How do we achieve that? And so when a, a, a guy that is a self-described socialist, if I may, Dion, and a longtime libertarian can agree on the end goal, but not necessarily agree on the per policy prescription. That's what you want, right? Like we have an understanding, you know, I want him to feel heard and I want to be heard. And that's kind of like why, like I stuck up for the Michigan protesters in some respects is that they just want to be heard just like the George Floyd protesters want to be heard. And when we all sit down and hear each other, the people that are causing our misery are in a lot of fucking trouble, <laughs> but it's going to take us as individuals deciding that unity, discomfort, grace, love, patience, returning to these values as a society or creating them for the first time, depending are, are really important. And, and we can be the generation to do that because you know, Dion, earlier when I was talking about the the system that allowed us to get to this point where we have this level of uh, economic freedom and social freedom, how many people had to die for that? He's right. A lot of people had to die to get to the place where they they got the rights that they were inherently deserving of. And it's up to us to preserve that. 
and to honor those those lives that were lost. You know, it is up to us to make sure that no more lives are lost. Be it in a war, be it in large scale societal conflict, or be it in a young mother who shouts all lives matter, pisses somebody off and gets a bullet to the head. Each and every person listening to this has a personal responsibility in what they say to others in person and online because it, collectively it does matter. It does raise the tension. And all it takes is just for a few hundred people across this country to start opting out of the culture wars and saying to win the culture war, I'm going to start bringing people together and talking to other people that I don't agree with, or I don't understand to have an understanding for us to completely win the culture war without another drop of blood and to start having a liberal society in the way that the classical liberal school meant for it, that you have the ability to say anything. What happened to me on Twitter when I defended Joe Jorgensen, or what, frankly, I'm, I know that Dave Smith is a, is a great podcaster, but what Dave Smith was doing to Joe Jorgensen was a form of cancel culture. It wasn't an honest, open dialogue with Joe Jorgensen about her beliefs. He was calling her out. He was saying to his following, attack that woman for having Marxist beliefs. When the woman, are we supposed to sit here and believe that the woman who is from South Carolina, this middle-aged white woman, is a secret Marxist, Marxist plant. She was a secret Marxist in college and decided to run on the Libertarian Party ticket in 1996 and then has just been biding her time these last 30 years waiting for her moment to strike and make the Libertarian Party liberal. Don't insult my intelligence. George Jorgensen is not some Marxist plant. And if you said that, you looked foolish. And then you got mad when people said you looked foolish. And they were mad because you're contributing to call-out culture, which was stupid. Instead of saying, I'm going to offer some grace to the Libertarian Party presidential candidate and ask her to clarify what she believed. In a polite manner. Well, she did. She yeah. did. Yeah. But it took a lot and of it, preaching to get there. Yeah, it's the, the same cancel culture that they complain about. That they, they spend all of their time fighting and arguing about identity politics. And then uh, Tom Woods retweets some guy today who says... Um, you know, something about back black people and, and capitalism, black people should be capitalists. And it's like, aren't you retweeting out the same identity politics that you say you don't like? Eric July does the same thing where he talks about people shouldn't be racist or talking about race anymore. If we just shut up about it, it would go away and, and that sort of thing. And then the minute someone calls him out in a position that makes him uncomfortable, he says, well, I'm a black man and you're telling a black man how to how to think about this. What are you, what's wrong with you, right? They he uses it in the way that he says it shouldn't be used whenever it suits their needs. And that's because they don't have the they're they're acting out of a, a more visceral emotional place than they are thinking about it and trying to be honestly open with the people that they're talking to. They're trying to win a little war. They're trying to win a culture war. They don't care about who gets hurt in the way or what the really the facts are as long as they win. Yep. Uh, and it's not an attack on those guys. It's just that mm -hmm. they're floating the movement more towards anti-left populism than they are. Gr not in all cases, but I just think that focusing on I feel like I have to say it carefully because if you criticize the Mises crowd or Ron Paul or Tom Woods or Dave Smith, they will cancel you. You get a horde. Mm -hmm. And you, you, if you are not on their team blindly, you live in fear of talking about them. And is that not the very thing that they built their horde upon? <laughs> you know, and, and I have a lot of respect for Tom Woods, like a tremendous amount. And I'm a subscriber to his thing. And like, I've learned a ton from him. Like I, I, I truly have, you know, and, and the, I don't listen to Dave Smith, so I don't know a lot about him, but I know that he's very well respected by a lot of people that I respect too. So I'm not trying to be too critical. I'm saying if you're a listener of those programs, or if you are one of those people that are on those programs listening, which I highly doubt, like 
Are you holding the, up to liberal values, like classical liberal values of open and free exchanges? Like if you're Ryan Lindsay and you're a libertarian socialist who believes in deeply leftist, non-governmental solutions, you guys can't imagine what Ryan goes through. And I'm just talking in our private chat from me to him <laughs> because I'm constantly like, you know how much shit I take for you. But there's a big... There's a big I'm glad he's there. It, you, you're glad he's there because you're the moderate now. You're not the leftist like you used to be. Um, if, if you're trying to run We Are Libertarians and give a challenging look at a broad spectrum of libertarian <laughs> thought, it's not easy sometimes because you people call me Republicans, Democrats. I, get, I got swarmed by alt-right libertarians and communist libertarians this week on Twitter. Like it, it's th The idea that libertarians somehow stand for free speech does not match my experience over the past year when I try, or really my entire career, because I think racism is a great example of it. To be anti-racist is not to be pro-state. You can be anti-racist and anti-state, and you can adv advocate for persuading people to see fellow human beings as inherently, uh, inherently deserving of all the due dignity that a a breathing person is allowed and it doesn't require a government solution to believe that like i don't understand what's anti-libertarian about that so th there's just a lot going on in the movement that is is just sort of confusing because we've we've become anti-left reflexively and we have lost sight of the values that libertarians hold to you know not in all cases but on this specific issue i just think it's 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 sort of confusing what I get from just your random anonymous libertarian account. You know, I, I'm sure Dave and Tom put a lot of, of thought into their stuff. So um, Dion says, call it what you want. I think money shouldn't trump my humanity. If the reason you can't see me as a human is because I don't have enough zeros in my bank account, then we are fucked. Uh Laura replies, I think people who are more worried about those who are coming up and beginning to accum accumulate lots of zeros in the bank account. Um, Derek says, so many friends of mine are put off by the quote libertarians you are describing. I thought it was bad when I had to deal with friends talking about libertarians wanting to end statutory rape laws. Uh, Wes says, what I don't grasp is why we are why are libertarians not rallying around economic issues that most of the left and right libertarians agree on why divide with social issues that mirror the rest of politics well that's the why can't we wait argument you know it, it, and martin luther king constantly had to to battle the why do, why why now why are why not wait why not wait why not wait argument from white liberals, from allies, from fellow black leaders, not just conservatives. Uh, why have these discussions about race? Because Philando Castile's dead. Because George Floyd's dead. You know, Tamir Rice is dead. Breonna Taylor is dead. Like the the some of the worst parts of policing are not just because of the culture of policing, but because your average American has voted the drug war in over and over and over on both sides. And if you look at the origin of the drug war, look up Ehrlichman's quote in Harper's Weekly, which we read on a previous episode, the origin of it was racist. They couldn't criminalize being anti-war or black to defeat the Black Panthers, so they started the war on drugs. And that has cannibalized people of color. Like uh, the the culture, politics is downstream from culture. It's that all the time. You know, malice has kind of repopularized that. If politics is consistently harming one segment of society, and then you point that out, and you're attacked for pointing that out, like here's what I mean. The same people who tell me that racism doesn't exist are the most pissed off at me when I talk about racism. 
<laughs> like, okay, I don't, I, you know, you don't see the disconnect there. Like, you know, so I don't know. I think, I think these issues are worth talking about because it, it, if you don't constantly reassert the humanity and dignity of every human being in every news story and every current event, people lose sight of that. And I, I haven't said this on the show, but I firmly believe it. The reason that most people don't care about coronavirus is that most people just don't care about 136,000 Americans dying. Like, I think people will say they care, and I think they'll make shows to show that they care, but I think they don't personally really care all that much about piles of bodies. Like Bill Gates early on said, you know, it's hard to ignore all those piles of bodies over there. I don't agree with you, Bill. Like, I think that most people are perfectly willing to accept piles of bodies as long as it doesn't personally affect their economic situation or habits. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of piles of body in the Middle East and, and Northern Africa and everywhere else that we've been bombing, right? So it doesn't seem to affect a lot of people. You know, they continue yeah. to support that stuff. How many, how many out of the, how many episodes? 447 episodes of the show out of the 700 and some feed items are we just continually over and over and over trying to get people to think empathetically and think about other people as human beings and worthy of dignity? You know, there's a great book that I haven't started yet, but I bought called resisting throwaway culture, you know, re resisting the throwaway culture of the elderly, you know, like how many of you have parents or, or grandparents in nursing homes and you just haven't called them in like a month or two months or, you know, it's like there it's inconvenient to go see them. And, you know, I love them, but I, you know, I really got to take the kids to the baseball game. You know, it's it, <laughs> like, what are you supposed to like? Think about that. So unfortunately the human brain is just kind of wired for tribalism to not see other people as people to think about our own selves selfishly and libertarianism so it's kind of like, where where do we end, right? Where's the end goal? I, I just I just believe that a free society is dependent upon mutual respect. It's it's going to require you to share some measure of a community with people you hate and disagree with, personally, culturally, religiously, identity wise. Like there are people that you are going to always share a, now maybe there are like some pure white supremacist societies and a libertarian anarchotopia and maybe there are some uh marcus garvey you know admission to living in this community is based on your your ethnicity maybe that exists right okay but by and large i believe that a libertarian society looks much like ours i still believe we're a free society as long as we don't slip into two sides fighting for control of the gun and we all get killed in the process, you're going to need other people for all kinds of different things globally and locally. And so like the idea that you, you can segregate yourself into perfect white societies, that's, that's over. Like, that you're going to have a hegemonic media representation of white faces only that's over. You've like, it's not a matter of losing like, cause that denotes that somehow that's bad. Like black kids get to should have the ability to turn on the television and see faces that look like theirs in commercials playing with toys. Like, how's that a bad thing? You know, it has nothing to do with politics. It, it, it's just the fact that, other people exist in society that don't think like you, look like you, act like you. It's okay. <laughs> like multiculturalism to me, Reinhold, just doesn't scare me, you know? No, I, I embrace it. I think it's what's made America great is the fact that we've taken the best and and uh, thoughts and feelings and thinkings of all these different societies that have come together and melded together and become something above it and beyond it and better than what it was originally. And I think that's why in the end, I think we're going to have something great to show for it. 
Uh, I think that we're eventually going to get there. I mean, the, the whole racism thing is going to go away in 120 years anyway, right? So 150 years from now, there's not going to be white and black and all that stuff. It's going to be a lot of brown. 40% multi-ethnic. Millennials yeah. are. That doesn't even count, include Gen Z or what, what's next. Like, mm-hmm. why not start working on these muscles now? Like, why yeah. fight for something that is never going to be maintained? Because what happens is that conservative, conservative libertarians, right-leaning libertarians, Republicans, you don't sit at the table and have conversations and then get mad that you're excluded from the conversations. And so you seeded conversations around a lot of these cultural issues to the left. You know, if you want there to be a Republican or a, a right leaning world of journalists, like Jonah Goldberg says this all the time, like, just go be a journalist. Like, if you want there to be more Republicans in education, then just go join and be a teacher, right? Like, stop trying to tear down this, like, create all these notions and you need to do it this way and do it that way. And I'm going to pass laws. Like, just go engage in this stuff, recruit people to engage in certain things. So, like, it, by not participating in what what are the new institutions? What are the pow- centers of power? What are the ways, what are the media outlets of 100 years from now? What are, what are all these institutions that are changing? Like Walter Cronkite used to end every newscast with, then that's the way it was, because that's the way it was. That one guy said how it was, and everybody believed that one guy. That's not how it exists anymore. We now live with hundreds of different little media institutions from various different viewpoints. Why be mad about it? Start a We Are Libertarians. Engage in it. Start talking. If you are concerned about natural rights disappearing, start talking about natural rights to people that don't understand natural rights. I don't understand the pushback of right libertarians saying to We Are Libertarians, stop saying that. When I've never had more people who generally vote Democrat look at libertarians and say, hey, some of your ideas make sense than they have in the last year, like the last four months. How is that a bad thing? You know, you shared a screenshot of a Bernie uh, supporter, and she's like, I found out about the Libertarian Party. I'm a Libertarian now. Like, why just try to keep the club paleocon, (laughs) you know, and, and pure and... Like, let's open it up and let's start having discussions and convincing people that n- the natural rights tradition is the only way to organize society because it allows everyone to pursue their passion. It allows people to be free without other people trying to control them and putting a boot on their neck. Why wouldn't you talk? To the- the, why wouldn't you say that to the people who are the most ardent supporters or, or, or the people who are generally left? that make up this country, why wouldn't you want to persuade them? Because I've already got the Rep- the Republicans are coming with us when the Libertarians are in charge. It's, it's, it's the Marxists, it's the AOC likers, it's the, the Biden voter that is the, going to be the predominant culture in 20 years. And it's, it's important for them to understand what we believe and why and that we're not evil. Well, the thing is, I too find a lot when I talk to a lot of people who are Democrats and in they come to the place of they're supporting Democrats because they're anti-Republican as it were. Right. So there, there's certain things that they agree with. They don't like crony capitalism. Well, neither do we, when they don't like, um, but they, but they don't, there aren't given the reasons why they should embrace free market capitalism as opposed to the crony capitalism. That's horrible for them. So they hear about the socialism and they decide, oh, that's the way we need to go. It's just them not hearing the the reasons. We agree on a lot of the problems. It's the solutions we don't agree upon necessarily. And a a lot of times, as soon as you talk to uh, somebody who's on the left who says, you know, I think that we should have, everybody should have this and everybody should be able to make this much money and everybody should be able to have access to healthcare and all this stuff. And you say, okay, who are you going to put the gun? Who's, whose head are you going to put the gun to in order to achieve that? Or maybe there's a better way. And once they realize that any government action is force, it is backed by the explicit use of force. And it's the force that they're living under right now. That's 
causing all the problems, the police state uh, enacting all of these so many laws that they can pull anybody over and just make their life hell uh, because there's so many things that they can get them for. Right. And they can destroy the communities for that. That's how, what they're doing. So why would you give that government entity more power over you? Let's find a better way to do that. They start to hear that solution and say, wait a minute, you might be right there. Right. So once they understand that we're trying to get to the same point where everybody is equal and free and has access, equal access to everything that the society has to offer. And, and defend and, and we all defend each other's rights all the time. We don't pick and choose and 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 try to try to limit anybody from having the same access as anybody else. Once they understand that that's really what libertarianism is for. They start to move away from that and, and question, well, maybe we shouldn't have all of these laws. Maybe there's a way to do that. That's better. And if libertarians would spend more time showing why crony capitalism is bad, but free market capitalism is good and what the difference is and why it works better and why it frees people and going out and building organizations that can take the place of those institutions to, to the point of we don't need to have them anymore because we're already taking care of the problem without the government. Once we start doing that, then all of this stuff goes away, right? This whole battle goes away, but we're so focused because we have this, these these people who want power over you, these authoritarians in the, both the right and the left, who want to tell you tell other people how to live their lives because they think they know better. So they keep each other at each other's throat and focusing on the little stuff and the minutia and the you know there's somebody painted a sign. Oh my god, who cares? <laughs> Just let's focus on fixing things and making society better so that we don't have to have this fight anymore. We can focus on making each other better and happier and wealthier and uh, just a better overall experience for life. But the people are scared. That's why I always tell people, I said, when people are going to embrace libertarianism overnight because they don't, you haven't explained it to them well enough and they're going to be scared. You have to prove to them that it works. So until you can prove to them that it works, they're going to want to be able to wake up the day after voting for somebody and know that they can still go to, to the work. They can, the kids can still go to school. There's everything is going to be basically the same. It's not going to be complete chaos the day after nobody wants that. They're not going to vote for that. Yeah. Prove to people that you can do it and, and succeed at it. And it's, it will be undeniable at that point. The lovely Maria. Maria Big Brown says, sorry, I got in so late. Conversation sounds informative. It was extremely informative, very long winded. And uh, please, if you enjoyed this, please share it with your friends. Uh, we would love for more people to listen to We Are Libertarians and understand our point of view. We would like to be heard. Uh, Dion says, you can't be a libertarian if you don't have liberty. Fucking A. See, I'm going to... I'm gonna, Dion in his stage show mentions Joe Jorgensen, and I, I think that uh, he is literally the first person behind a microphone in 2020 to say the words Joe Jorgensen other than uh, libertarian podcasters. So that was very exciting. I want to thank our patrons. They are so supportive and, uh, and always correcting, especially when I go too hard in the paint and send me notes and say, hey, Tone it down a bit. It, it's really hard. Reinhold, you know this. Like, and I, I'm talking to young young Ryan about this all the time. I don't suffer fools well. And there's a lot of fools on the internet. And I'm trying to bring people together. But I also like to troll people. And people are also kind of annoying. And so it's just like <sighs> sometimes I want to post this meme. And and uh, sometimes you shouldn't. Well, there's a reason why I filter my memes through you right now. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm a reasonable editor around here. Uh, so our patrons are super generous. They are really... Uh, listen, we couldn't do this without patrons. We've grown to a point that I can no longer afford to do this. And uh, you guys are all stars. Every one of you, thank you all for being patrons. Especially our hundred dollar a month patrons: Anthony Meyer, Brad Tracy, Craig DaCosta, Ed Brehob, Jason Doolittle, Jeff Bennett, Christy Avery, and Matthew Durbin. 
So thank you guys so much. I'm so sorry to, to mention you so late in the show, but uh, I just got off. I couldn't, I've had three weeks of, I, I had, I drove to Florida in my car alone, listening to audiobooks about culture and alt-right and libertarianism and lost cause myths and, and Democrats and Marxism. And I was just like, I can't wait to get back. I have a screech for everybody. So uh, thank you for your patience for my monologue at the beginning, Reinhold, especially. Not a problem. Go ahead. Final thoughts. Final thoughts. Um, I, I was trying to say before, I think we're just getting through the inevitable end game of society where we're going to no longer even care about race. It's not going to be an issue because everybody's going to look. Um, th there's not going to be distinctions anymore because there's just going to be so much change and intermingling and stuff that all the stuff that caused us to kind of diverge from being different uh, are coming back together. and We're not going to have that anymore. So I, I think eventually it's going to go away, but there's fits and starts to everything. And, and I think we've marched with a pretty lofty goal back in the early days of this country that we never fully realized and we still haven't fully realized, but we're trying really hard to live up to. And I think people feel that, that they want to live up to that idea. It's just hard. And there's just a lot of stuff going on and there's personal stuff and there's emotional stuff. And we're going to eventually get there. We're, we're just going to have these fights from time to time as culture starts to change. And as we start to, to make that progress. So I still feel feel hope. I've seen a lot of this happen in the past. I, I kind of remember a little bit of the of the early '70s that was going on as I was growing up, and I, I'm seeing a lot of the same stuff. And I think we're going to be okay in the end. Let's just try to get there and try to think about other people while we're doing it and have empathy for them. Yeah, and and my final thought is along those lines. And and so, you know, I mentioned earlier that the whole point of a representative democracy is that when you want to remove something like a statue, it goes through a formal process where everybody can be heard and then an action is taken in agreement by the majority. And sometimes that process breaks down. And the and the the check and balance, the whole system is built on checks and balances. The check and balance on a local government or or a state or national government in addition to checks and balances like the three branches of government, the, the electoral college, the, the man, the check and balance that was the electoral college system where you had faithless electors that the, the Supreme Court stupidly ruined that check and balance. Uh, the ultimate check and balance is the majority of people and public opinion that lives in that community. It always has been. And so when the wrong decision is made, there's backlash to it, you know, and I think what um, many people of color are saying is that it, it's like the but Chicago thing. Do we think that black leaders and black politicians and black pastors and black residents don't care about the violence in Chicago? Forgive me, but that's insane and insulting, right? Like they deeply care. It's just that they don't have the power to stop the policies that have contributed to the violence because the majority of this country keeps voting that in. And so it's going to take a majority of this country, which happens to be white to fix those imbalances, to fix those problems. It's up to the people of this country to start <laughs> stepping in and being a check and balance. I wish people cared more about regulating their government than they did regulating the behavior of their neighbor. I mean, and that's really, we've just seen an off the chart number of people who want to regulate each other as opposed to regulating the thing that is causing most of the misery for all of us. Like just get out of our way, let us be peaceful and productive and stop dividing us. Because when you have something as powerful as these various forms of government, people are going to fight tooth and nail to keep control of those systems because they view it as survival. Voting becomes self-defense. It's no longer about natural rights and protecting liberty. It's now about effing the other guy before they eff you. And that's a horrible way to, to live. That's a horrible society that we live in. And people want that message. They want to hear that message. They want to understand that message. And we've got to be out there talking about it and talking about these issues 
And instead of like ostriching by saying, but Chicago, we should say, but Chicago is dangerous because of these reasons. And it's the majority that needs to fix it. You know, I was encouraged when I drove up Meridian Street, which is, you know, above 38th Street. It's one of the wealthier parts of town. And it's a predominantly white part of town because lots of money, right? Lots of heritage families who've been around a long time own those homes. Black Lives Matter signs in a lot of those yards. And I guarantee you that the person that is the CFO of a Fortune 500 company that lives in one of those houses is not putting a Black Lives Matter sign out in front of his yard because he's a secret undercover Marxist that wants to overthrow you and replace you with a migrant worker. He is putting, he or she, or Z, is putting that sign in their front yard because they deeply care about liberty for everyone. And we have the ability to connect with them and be partners with them. And then, oh, by the way, here's how our economic side also brings about more liberty. Here's where the the elite on the left and the Marxists are wrong about the economic side. They may be right about X, but they're wrong about Z. And so we need to be engaging in those discussions in good faith, and we need to be engaging in those discussions in uh, serious ways because people are desperate to hear what we have to say. And libertarianism, it is the, the ideology of the future because it's the only workable solution that allows every person to achieve the full potential that lies within each and every one of them. So please keep sharing this show. Please talk, keep talking about libertarianism. This is the one. Every four years, people are more interested now than ever before. We see explosive growth here on the network. That's how I know your friends and family are super interested. Uh, and we would uh, just appreciate you sharing information and then, uh, you know, just talking about libertarianism. Just let people know, hey, I'm a libertarian. And uh, the more people go, oh, I realize libertarians are all weird. I heard about that on the internet. That's that's true. Um, so thank you, everybody, for listening. We really do appreciate it, and we appreciate you. So thank you so much for joining us, and we will talk to you soon.